Good morning, everyone. This is week four of Social Work 636. And week four is on the management of organizations. So let's look at the week four learning materials first. There are a number of readings for this week. So we have a, an article on developing policy and management leaders, eight social work policy fellows share their experiences, case studies and recommendations for leadership development. We have one, two, three, four, five chapters out of the book, Effectively Managing Human Service Organizations, and we'll go over some of that material. We have two articles around institutional barriers to academic success for women and women of color faculty at large inst institutions. So if you are wondering why there is a lack of minority w women faculty that advance in organizations, specifically universities, and this is a good article to read, and then reconstructing the language of the achievement gap to an opportunity gap, the counter narratives of three African American women school leaders. There are three sets of slides that we will go over today. And there are two videos. One is on nine tips to a better leader. And that video, take a look at it. Both of them are short videos. But they essentially say that leaders are not born. That is a misconception. Um, so leaders can be developed. And nine tips for effective leadership include having integrity, that actions speak louder than words, that we should lead by example, be persuasive. How can others benefit from the actions that are taking, taken in an organization, make others feel important, provide praise in public, but criticism in private, and take responsibilities for mistakes. Hopefully I've covered all nine. Um, uh, now have a vision, put goals in writing, be knowledgeable, and surround yourself with great people. The other video is around social workers uh, as having a superpower. So social workers as superheroes. And essentially this video says that everyone's going to need a social worker at one point from birth to end of life. That social workers are the ones that see things that need to be changed and can make change happen and that we believe in strength. And that is that we believe in helping people find their superpower. And that's why social workers are superheroes. The specific learning objectives for this week are to articulate the purposes of management, to articulate the types of management models, and to examine and describe the characteristics of effective man managers. And in this session, we're going to address the purposes and value of management, as well as management models, and the characteristics of good managers will be examined. For this week, there is one discussion post, and it's on trauma characteristics. So in a somewhat continuation of looking at the shared case of Anita and her family. This week, we're going to think about how trauma informed your agency field placement setting is both to those persons who work there and for clients who use the services. So to do so, you need to go to this link for the TISAS survey. You don't need to take or administer the survey, but rather think about the questions on the survey beginning on question 27, where it says trauma-informed characteristics. So you're asking the following questions in a, 
In addition, as an employee student intern, what types of any or training does the agency provide on client needs, effective improving services, effective supervision, or staff self-care? Is this training sufficient? Why or why not? Next, think of yourself as a client coming to that agency. What aspects of the agency experience would make for a positive impression to you? And what aspects of the experience would make it painful, traumatic, or negative? And so your initial post is due Thursday and your follow-up is due by Sunday. Next, we'll go back and look at the both slides and a brief PowerPoint that I put together on the readings from the uh, text for this week. So let's continue with talking about at least three of the chapters in the text. I did not go over the last two chapters on time management and uh, evidence-based. Uh, chapter 17, evidence-based management, but I did go over the others. So leading the organization. In organizations, there is an interplay that exists among management orientation, staff behaviors, attitudes, and situational factors. In terms of leadership styles, there are many leadership styles, but the reading talks about directive leadership, assuming personal responsibility for making major decisions and then, then acts as a taskmaster to get things done. Participative leadership is ideas get presented and staff are invited to give feedback and delegative leadership. And that is when a leader derives considerable satisfaction from giving decision-making responsibilities to their staff. There are also some leadership challenges and they include being an oblivious manager. And that's one that assumes staff knows what they're doing and then gives little direction. The misleader who gives mix, mixed messages or incorrect ones. The put downer, which is a person who humiliates their employees. The micromanager is being over involved. The arrogant manager has an exaggerated sense of their own self and their own pride. The narcissist who manipulates others to achieve personal ambition. The loner who has a closed door versus an open door policy. And the charmer who tries to gain personal acceptance from staff which is more important to them than what the staff accomplishes. What are some characteristics of effective leaders? They constantly seek out trends and determine how those trends might influence their organization. They are social entrepreneurs. They're driven to pursue programs that they consider vital to meeting needs. They feel a heightened sense of accountability to the constituencies they serve. They're persistent, persistent in accomplishing goals, even in the face of setbacks. Effective leaders treat staff with digni dignity. They communicate well. They communicate concepts, ideas, and philosophy so that staff understand them both intellectually and emotionally in terms of how they're involved. They endear trust. They inspire high performance with realistic expectation, and they understand their own leadership styles. So managing employees. It's important to conduct interviews that are non-discriminatory, hopefully in organizations they have vetted the questions that get asked at, at every interview to make sure that questions that are biased, questions that might be discriminatory or left out of that interview process and that everybody is asked the same questions. They 
make sure that new hires receive complete information so that there are not unmet expectations. This is one of the reasons that new hires might quit very early on in their employment. And there is good staff development. Training should fit within the overall strategy or, of the organization. Training should ensure a receptive climate. Best training is on the job. So sometimes we engage in weeks and weeks and weeks of training. And at some point we need to balance that with making sure people can start their um, employment and know the responsibilities of their job sooner versus later. Training that is anchored in reality and using case methods of training, which make it much more real versus abstract. Organizational productivity is tied to looking at staffing patterns. So structure impacts that productivity. We've talked before about bureaucratic or hierarchical structures, which encompass usually having specialized jobs, accountability to a higher authority, and promotion is on the basis of competence. There's the market format hierarchy where, where staff move in and out of assignments based on the changing needs of the organization, and the matrix team-based format, which operates often temporarily within an organization and it's divided in functional areas versus hierarchical areas. How do we reduce staff turnover, which is more and more difficult in human service organizations? We find ways to enrich the job. We, re we reduce staff turnover by making sure staff have realistic expectations, we provide good support systems, and we have a good orientation from the beginning. We pay attention to the work environment. It's important that people aren't jammed in the little cubby holes, that the environment is just not um, conducive to good, uh, good learning, to good interaction. We, we pay attention to those environmental factors. We analyze when problems occur. Has somebody been passed over? Have we instituted all these technological requirements that a otherwise good employee have are having difficulty keeping up with? Is an employee mis, mis, mismatched for a particular job? Maybe they would work better in another part of the organization. Do we have someone who is a work climate spoiler or someone who just doesn't do their job? And as a, as a way to avoid work, they do less and less, which sometimes then gets put on other people. And should we look at their training to see if they were poorly trained? So supervisors are coaches and counselors. So similar to direct practice, Supervisors need to engage in active listening. They need to be reflective. They need to help their supervisees in skill development to help them set intermediate goals to partialize um, tasks so that they can be accomplished. To allow for trial and error, people can make mistakes and, and can learn from those mistakes should encourage open and honest communication and role-playing difficult situations as we will with a client we could do with our supervisees. In terms of continuing discussion about the role of the supervisor, supervisors can be judges. How well are staff achieving their objectives? The Explorer engages staff as partners in searching for solutions to problems. The competitor seeks high performance levels, but those levels are realistic. The treasure hunter must be mindful of the organization's resources. So the, the supervisor is also one to help with resource, resource gathering. Supervisors sometimes have to face the public. Many of our public organizations have people that they employ who specifically work for the public, but supervisors sometimes have to attend outside meetings. They have to 
They might be asked to answer questions from the media, depending on your organization. So they have to be prepared and should be advocates for their staff. The reading talked about several motivational theories. One was Maslow's hierarchy of need, especially the, the section on self-actualization and personal growth. McGregor's theory X and theory Y. Theory X essentially says that workers need to, workers only work because they're pushed to work. They have to be, it's directive, they have to be controlled. So the the, supervise someone operating under theory x is concerned with persuading rewarding and punishment but under theory y the assumption is exactly the opposite that staff want to do a good job that they're enthusiastic that they will assume responsibility so managers are to help them take responsibility and initiative for their work performance most people think that it is more than money that motivates people to do work in a job. So the theory why would be um, most effective. McClellan's need for achievement theory says that staff differ in their desire for self-fulfillment. So managers need to match individual needs to job roles. Broom's expectancy theory says that motivation is influenced by the individual's perception that better performance means greater rewards. In many ways, it's like theory X. And Hirschberg's hygiene motivational theory says that, that there are those hygiene factors, and again, those involve money and supervision and, and those kinds of factors versus factors that motivate individuals. The supervisor relationship, if it's going to be a good one, set and or identify positive examples for others to follow, take time to know the staff, give clear instructions, sell rather than tell, foster a collaborative spirit, engage staff in problem solving and provide constructive criticism. Supervisory mistakes, don't over control staff, don't set up employees for failure by assigning them projects they're not qualified to do, do not play with the truth, do not play favorites, don't encourage clicks and identify multiple ways to achieve a goal and the references are from the text. Now let's quickly go over the slides that are part of the resources for this week. So some of it may be a little duplicative, but hopefully most of it is new information. So these next slides look at leadership in organizational practice. And we're going to look at the challenges, the ethics and ethical dilemmas, and some additional key attributes of leadership. So what is management? Most simply, management is the act or skill of controlling and making decisions, and it's connected to administration. It involves the utilization of human and other resources in a manner that best achieves the plans and objectives of the organizations. Why is this important? Organizations are complex. To have the organization achieve its desired outcome, someone needs to watch over the process, and that is often the management role. We talked about bureaucracies. One of the first important theorists was Max uh, Weber, who talked about the analysis of the bureaucracy, which informs much of our thinking today. So under his theory, Competent organizations have three competencies, a rigid division of labor, regulations that establish the chain of command and the duties, and that people are hired with certain qualifications to support the regular and continuous execution of the assigned duties. 
These competencies suggest a series of norm normative characteristics like specialized role, recruitment based on merit, uniform principles of placement, promotion, and transfer in an administrative system, careerism with a salary structure, a hierarchy that determines responsibility and accountability, subjection of official conduct, conduct to strict rules of discipline and control, supremacy of abstract rules, and impersonal authority. So managers have to plan, they have to organize, they have to lead, and they control, which is the monitoring and evaluation of tasks. What skills are needed? Conceptual skills, being able to do analysis, interpersonal skills, meaning good communication, technical skills, knowing how to perform day-to-day -day tasks, and the ability to make good decisions. So being a manager is a skill, and there are different levels of managers with different levels of authority. So we have your top managers, your middle managers, and your frontline supervisory managers. So your top management sets new plans and communicates those plans to all managers. Your middle and top managers determine how many new employees to hire, how to organize workflow, and how to obtain funds, and your supervisory managers provide job assignments to the new employees who are hired and set time schedules for those who are hired. Relationship of role to task, the following show slides show how the management level and task interface, and I will let you look at this slide. There are many management styles. We've mentioned a few already but they can include the autocratic, the democratic, and what is often termed the laissez-faire. So if, if one is an autocratic or authoritarian manager, they make all the decisions, all the information management is kept with that person, the direction of the business remains con constant, decisions are quick because they're often unilateral. And this in turn can project an image of confident, well-managed business, but subordinates or supervisees are often not involved in helping to make any decisions with the organization. So it can decrease motivation and increase t turnover. The democratic or participative manager empowers folks employees are a part of the decision making process it can be particularly useful when complex decisions meet, need to be made it is much more satisfactory but it can be slower because more people have to be involved in the decision making and then the laissez-faire the leader delegates much of the authority they're not involved in the decision making at all so for highly professional and creative groups, this might work for them. The leader evades the duties of management and people sometimes who need more focus don't have that focus with someone who doesn't give much direction. So it's also good to know what kind of supervisor you are and the kind of supervise, supervision that you require. So different management styles can be used based on the culture of the organization, what task needs to happen, and the experience and personality of the workforce. And managers should use a range of techniques and styles as appropriate. So what is leadership versus management? Leadership is setting a new direction or vision for a group that they follow. Management controls or directs people, resources in a group according to principles or values that have already been established. What makes a great leader? Our early theory, theory said that leaders are exceptional people born with innate qualities, destined to lead. Again, we've already said that that is not correct. 
that yes, there are people who seem to be natural leaders, but leaders can in fact be developed. So it, it's not true that you have to be quote unquote born a leader. What are important leadership traits and skills? I won't read all of these, but there are the traits and there are the skills. Take a look at those, see if they are ones that you have now or that you aspire to. Leadership theory, there are functional theories. A leader is concerned with the interaction of three areas, the task, what needs to be done, the team, who's gonna do it, and then the individual members of a team. The behaviorist theories would say, would look at leaders' behaviors and actions rather than their traits and skills. Different leadership behaviors are characterized as leadership styles and behavior, behaviorist theories don't provide guide to effective leadership in different situations. So leadership theory, there is uh, the situation and contingency leadership and I will let you look at this particular chart. Some of the new leadership theories talk about transformational leadership. These are ones who inspire individuals, develop trust and encourage creativity and personal growth. Individuals develop a sense of purpose to benefit the group, organization or society. And this goes well beyond their self-interest and an exchange of rewards or recognition for effort or loyalty. Leadership philosophy, ethical leadership. Ethics permeates everything we do. We know our code of ethics. And so ethical leadership, the four Ps are purpose, people, planet, and probity. What are some key team leader responsibilities to guide and coordinate, to provide structure, to clarify working methods, and to look at performance? We've talked about authority, accountability, responsibility, responsibility and authority. So I won't go through all of those in particular. But a team leader authority will value from role to role, depending on the scope or duties of the organization. So how can you improve your leadership skills? Reflect and identify the skills you need to lead. Ask for feedback from, from others. Practice, which means taking on some responsibility and evaluating your own performance. Find a mentor, which is always a good idea. Get as much training as you can. And there are many, many, many resources. This is one source of resources, but there are many resources out there that can help. And lastly, let's talk about ethics and leadership. So what are ethics? There are code of moral principles, standards of good and bad as opposed to right and wrong. And what is accepted as good and right in the context of the government governing moral code? What is operating with ethical behavior, law, values, and ethical behavior? Legal behavior is not necessarily ethical behavior. Personal values help determine individual ethical behavior. And we can look at terminal values and instrumental values. As supervisors, workers, wherever we are in an organization, we are going to face those ethical dilemmas. This is when we have to make some choices or decisions and struggling on making that right decision creates the ethical dilemma. So ethical dilemmas include possible dis discrimination, sexual harassment, conflicts of interest, customer conflict, conflict and organizational resources. So what influences us as managers? So it's the manager as a person, who they, who one is internally, the organization and its policies and procedures in organizational culture and what's going on 
on the outside, which can influence our ethical managerial behavior. So what do you do when you face an ethical dilemma? Clearly, that's no, there is no universal response. Our code of ethics guides us very clearly in terms of making ethical decisions. Supervisors can help guide us in making ethical decisions. If in doubt, ask for supervisory input. We first have to recognize the ethical dilemma. We get the facts. We identify the option. We test the option, decide which option to follow. And again, before we take any action, if in doubt, check with others to give us guidance. Ethical training. We, as licensed social workers, are required during the two-year licensure period to attend at least one training specifically on ethics. This keeps us informed, keeps us discussing issues around ethical dilemmas, and there is a reason for us to get continued training because things change in the organizational arena. We have to be up to date but we have to always operate with a sense of integrity and ethics. We as managers have to be ethical role models. We influence the ethical behavior of people we supervise. We don't want to ever pressure anyone to do anything that's unethical, and we have to be realistic about performance. Again, our code of ethics, there's no excuse for not knowing the code of ethics because it's available to all of us. And we know via the code of ethics what we can and cannot do. So with that, that's going over the slides, the PowerPoint, what's required in the next week. If you have any questions, please let me know as quickly as possible. I look forward to reading your posts and have a wonderful week.